Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and thank you very much, uh, Richard, for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I've dealt with Ed Edelman uh, many times over my career, and most recently uh, in my role as chairman of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, which I like to think is the new Nobel Prize for Engineering, although I have to be careful about using those words. It's proved to be a very fruitful relationship uh, for us, although I fear it's an even more fruitful relationship for Edelman in that they managed to poach the director of the Queen Elizabeth Prize, Angie Hunter, uh, back to their firm. In my experience, the hallmark of a world-class public relations firm is that people care not just about what it does, but also about what it thinks. And the trust barometer is a prime example of the sort of work which makes Edelman stand out uh, in its industry. It paints, of course, uh, a dispiriting picture for society's most important institutions, trusting government and media falling, and although business is in better shape than it was several years ago, barely half of the barometer's respondents so, say that they would trust business to do the right thing. Business is the engine of human progress, so that's a very worrying position to be in. It seems clear to me that in spite of recent improvements, the relationship between business and society remains fractured. I want to make three points this morning about trust in business, which I hope can guide us towards a more optimistic future. First, business is making the same mistakes it made hundreds and even thousands of years ago, which means that we have a wealth of experience to draw upon. Second, uh, it's becoming more difficult for business to earn society's trust, a trend which ought to focus our minds on the search for a solution. And third, that solution is within our grasp. I believe that leaders already have the tools at their disposal to alter permanently the standing of business in society. Let me begin, if I may, uh, with the recurring cycles of anti-business sentiment and of corporate scandals which seem to characterize history. Humans are, of course, notoriously bad at learning from their mistakes. The behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman points to an ingrained overconfidence, which means that we're prone to repeating errors and that we irrationally believe that damaging events will never happen to us. It's tempting to believe that our own circumstances are always unique and that history will provide little guidance in how to act. In the words of the German philosopher George Hegel, what, and he quotes, what history teaches us is that people and governments have never learned anything from history. The same can be said of corporations. Last year's horsemeat scandal in Europe was reminiscent of the Chinese baby milk scandal in 2008. And both incidents were born of the same short-sighted greed that characterized Chicago's meatpacking district at the turn of the 20th century. And when Lonmin recently called in South African police to use what turned out to be lethal force against striking mine workers, it was following in the footsteps of Henry Frick one of Andrew Carnegie's lieutenants, who brutally suppressed Carnegie Steel workers during the Homestead Strike of 1892. In the short term, those incidents led to greater suspicion of business activity and imposed hidden costs on companies and consumers. In the long term, if the relationship between business and society breaks down, the consequences can be catastrophic. And that's a lesson we should have learned over 2,000 years ago, during the Han Dynasty of ancient China, when a debate ranged over the nationalization of the salt and iron industries. Different political factions had very different ideas. Legalists looked at the state to break the power of corrupt monopolies, while Confucians were suspicious of big business and of big government but both sides were united in their anti-business sentiment, which in my view contributed to the eventual decline of the advanced Chinese society 
relative to the West. Even when companies identify that something isn't right, they often see a problem which is out of their hands and resign themselves to the consequences. Some of the executives I've, I speak to are resigned to having no control over how people feel about business. But that only serves to exacerbate their difficulties and to reinforce these damaging cycles of anti-business sentiment. The fact that distrust in business and in different industries appears to ebb and flow should not give us cause for relief. Even if it is cyclical, businesses are needlessly repeating the mistakes of the past. Drawing on those experiences and learning from that history are now more important than ever, and it becomes even more difficult for business to earn society's trust in the future. My second point this morning. I've recently been interviewing senior executives for a book about business and its external environment. Most are aware of the cyclical nature of trust in business, but many feel that the bitterness towards corporations is different this time. That is in large part thanks to technology, which has increased a business's ability to do great harm. In my own industry, advances in technology and engineering mean that companies continue to push back the boundaries of what we once thought to be possible, from hydraulic fracturing to deep water drilling and from Arctic exploration to biofuels, we keep finding innovative ways to bring heat, light and power to billions of people around the globe. But with those great advances come greater risks, or at least greater perceived risks, and a more pressing need to gain society's trust. The energy industry in particular must take extraordinary steps to mitigate and to manage those risks and to demonstrate to society that it deserves its license to operate. Only then will it gain the trust it needs to operate at these new frontiers. The same is true in another rather unpopular industry, financial services. A senior executive of the Bank of England recently told me of his belief that high-frequency trading technology is simply too complicated for us to understand and that the causes of so-called flash crashes might also be actually unknowable. With that in mind, it's hardly surprising that trust in banks and financial services broke down and as JP Morgan found out on Twitter late last year, the recent recovery in trust ought not to be taken for granted. In almost every aspect of our lives, we rely on technology more than ever, which makes us increasingly vulnerable to its failures. That same technology has given us social media, a powerful tool for consumers and NGOs to put business activity under greater scrutiny than ever before. If businesses continue to repeat the mistakes of the past, they will be doing so with graver consequences, both to society and to their own longevity. The positive news is that a solution, I believe, is within our grasp, and that's my final point this morning. For business leaders preoccupied with quarterly results, it's tempting simply to let things take their course. As, last, as this year's barometer shows, trust in business will eventually recover, and broadly speaking, that rising tide will lift all corporate ships. But complacency will only take us so far. The growing concern around tax avoidance, internet surveillance and data collection suggest that the next corporate scandal is never far away. Fixing a long-term problem will not be easy, but if business leaders embrace three things, they stand a chance of perhaps all permanently altering the, standard, the standing of business in society. The first is failure. The acknowledgement and study of failure is the most effective mechanism for learning. But in my experience, both governments and businesses are often too reluctant to admit that things have gone wrong. The evidence in the barometer suggests that the public wants corporate leaders to tell the unvarnished truth, regardless of how complex or how unpopular it is. Trust begins with honesty and transparency, 
not with incomprehensible corporate jargon or with a 140-character tweet. The second is strong and smart regulation. Trust in government has fallen significantly, and businesses might see that as an opportunity to push for deregulation. But that would be a mistake. In my experience at BP and as chairman of Quadrilla, intelligent regulation shuts out free riders and protects an industry's reputation from the actions of a cavalier minority. The correct lesson from history is that regulation designed with care and collaboration can in fact reduce the long-term costs of doing business. And finally, leaders should examine deeply the purpose of their business activity. Every company should clearly define the contribution it makes to society, which extends beyond the merely financial. That should not be a difficult task. The profits from business lift whole nations out of poverty, they make philanthropy possible, and they support the next wave of transformative human progress. But that's poorly understood, both by business leaders and the rest of society. In my view, the next generation of CEOs will have to spend much more time than ever on issues that define and enact their company's core purpose. If business leaders are bold enough to take those steps, then they might just be able to mend the relationship between business and society. The prize for both parties is enormous. Business is like Janus, the two-faced god. It has enormous power for good and for harm. And that's perhaps best expressed through the element that's defined my life, carbon. During the Industrial Revolution, businesses which use carbon in the form of hydrocarbons lifted the Western world out of poverty. But we now know that the carbon dioxide emissions of corporations pose a serious threat to our common future. Whether we use business for human progress and prosperity or for individual greed and iniquity is entirely up to us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.